This person also has a second question, which is really interesting, I think. Is water the best coolant? Isn't there a liquid that can absorb heat more efficiently? Yeah, my father worked for Westinghouse, uh, and they were designing a liquid metal fast breeder reactor that used liquid sodium instead of water, because liquid sodium does a real good job of transferring heat. The problem with the sodium, when it reacts with water or air, it's explosive, uh, which makes it easy to find leaks in pipes and stuff, but it comes at a, kind of a high price. It's also very expensive. Fast breeder reactors are, are kind of like uh, racehorses as opposed to thorough, uh, workhorses. They're very finicky. It's very easy to lose control of a fast breeder reactor. So there's advantages to having liquid sodium remove the heat, but there's disadvantages be of having less control over the reactor. And trying to meet that challenge was so expensive that all the countries that have tried fast breeder reactors have given up as too expensive for the, the electricity you generate. You know, the, the flip side of that is that maybe we should look at something other than circaloid clay because it's stainless steel doesn't react with water to produce hydrogen. So maybe the industry needs to say, well, we should forget about using zircaloy cladding on our nuclear fuel. We need to look at a new metal to do that. The reason zircaloy was chosen is because uh, economically, it makes a lot of sense to you. It has a very high neutron economy. It doesn't eat neutrons, so you get more out of your core. Uh, but So it's about money. Zircaloy was chosen because it, it's the cheapest way to produce nuclear power. But there were reactors that had stainless steel before that, and there are other alternatives to zircaloy, which would avoid that explosion when you have cladding in touch with water. Interesting. Um, next question. This is for Mr. Gunderson. Is there a possibility that the de detonation happened as a result of a hydrogen explosion a few milliseconds previous, which deformed the plutonium in the fuel into a fission? Tiny criticality. The second part of that question: What are the implications for other fuel pools? The, the, the second part's a quicker answer. Um, all of all the fuel pools are susceptible to this, and there's a big dialogue in the groups that I contact pretty much daily about how that hydrogen was generated, why Unit Four exploded, even why Unit Three exploded. So that, that that's an open area, but but the all fuel pools are uh, vulnerable. It's not a Mark One issue or a BWR issue. It's a Seabrook issue as well. The, the second half is, could it be a fission? Uh, and, and the answer is really no. Uh, you need, in order to be, to, for the plutonium to cause a fission, um, they, they have to, <coughs> the atoms have to be very close together and in a sphere, and the weight has to be about five kilograms. Uh, and um, there can be no water. It's unmoderated. It's called a prompt criticality uh, using fast neutrons. And there's fast and delayed neutrons. It gets a little crazy. But the answer is no. It, I am I'm absolutely convinced that that was not a fission. Uh, uh, it's not clear to me. And I could actually, I'm, I'm actually convinced it was a criticality, but not a prompt, fast criticality. And it gets really. Check my website out, there's a longer description. There's one more part to this question, um, which I'm not sure I can actually read. It says, three days later, the EPA slash DOE underground detector found XC133. And that's an indication that it was efficient. <clears throat> so there is, there, there, there's some, the Xenon 133 is created in a fission. That's a possibility. This question is addressed to any of you who wants to answer it. Can any of you explain how Americans and the North American ecosystem might conceivably be affected over the next 50 years from the radiation still emanating from the crippled atomic plants on the other side of the Pacific? Does this scenario change the longer the radioactive debris remains uncontrolled and uncontained? Who would like to start? My colleague Ed Lyman has looked at uh, that question a little bit. Basically, 
there's detectable amounts of radiation in the United States, even in Miami, as it went across the United States due to the wind patterns. There, as Dick Clapp mentioned, there, we believe that there's no safe levels of radiation. So the more radiation you're exposed to, the, the, the worse it gets. Um, there won't be the, the worst population of those closest to the reactor. So it won't be as bad here as it is in Japan. We can detect the radiation. There, there are likely to be some consequences from that, but it won't, we won't have to monitor our foodstuffs, likely, uh, based on what's happened to date, um, any more than we do already. So I, I think that's pretty much where, where we're at. Let me like to touch on that. Um, immediately after the nuclear reactor uh, has a meltdown, there's an enormous cloud of, of noble gases, xenon and krypton, that are, that are emitted. And, and they surrounded Tokyo and they surrounded Fukushima and bombarded people from the outside with, uh, with gamma rays. And so the initial readings, when people were standing outside with Geiger counters, they were in a cloud of, of xenon and krypton gases uh, that was bombarding. Now, they're noble gases, so they don't react with your body um, and they have dispersed, and some of them have sh relatively short half-lives. Um, but the other piece of that is the, the cesium-137s and the uh, strontium-90s and things like that. Um, those um, can be aerosolized and become particles. Um, and we're pi they picked up the particles in air filters in Japan extensively, especially in the Fukushima prefecture. But even in Tokyo, uh, uh, I'm aware in Tokyo in April, uh, air filters, and think of a cigarette filter, and they pull through 10 cubic meters a day of air. That's what you normally breathe. A sedentary person breathes in about 10 cubic meters a day. Um, and those air filters were picking up on average about 10 hot particles, and that can be uh, transuranic like plutonium, it can be uh, cesium and strontium per day. Um, so it's fair to assume that people ingested or inhaled hot particles after the accident. Yeah. We also know that, um, that uh, uh, another university, it's not government science, but another university has, um, has examined Seattle. And in April, uh, Seattle was, uh, uh, people in Seattle were breathing in on average five hot particles a day. Uh, so um, now, those particles have dispersed pretty much through the northern hemisphere. Uh, the plants are still emitting some, but nowhere near as much as they did in, in March and April. Um, and I think we're at a point now where you can't run and you can't hide. The, the cesium and strontium are pretty much evenly distributed throughout the northern hemisphere now. Um, 